Hey everybody, this is Terry Mitchell with the Voice on Fire interview series. And for those of you who may not have tuned in to see any of my videos, what I'm doing is interviewing people that are change makers, difference makers, life influencers, they're action takers. These people are making a difference either in their local community or somewhere across the world. And I find their stories fascinating and I wanted to give them a platform so that the world could find out more about what they're doing. And my guest today is Sean McBride, or otherwise known as Captain Antarctica. Uh, Sean's not actually in Antarctica, though his uh, backdrop there may seem a little deceptive. Hey, Sean, you're up there in uh, Brisbane. How are you today? Oh, hi, Terry. Hi, Thanks for having me on. Yes, up here in Brisbane, and uh, it's chilly this morning. Yeah, but not quite as chilly as Antarctica might suggest in that um, backdrop there. No, not quite as cold as Antarctica. <laughs> so that leads us into the whole um, introduction about what it is you're doing. Um, now, you've got a fascinating background and there's so many things that you have done, which is a little bit of a challenge on which part of the story do we focus on. But I guess the whole um, focus is for you to just tell us, tell the audience what it is you're doing, why you're doing it and who you're doing it for. And, and just love to sort of feel out a little bit more. Maybe we'll start with Antarctica since that's the, the top of mind. Okay, fine. Well, uh, I suppose the short story is, you know, that throughout my life I've had, um, I've kind of slipped in and out of depression um, over various uh, things. Mm -hmm. And uh, Antarctica was probably something that saved me when I was in a, um, a real downtime. I decided to set myself the challenge of getting to Antarctica. <clears throat> and I, I managed to do it and uh, camped on the Ross Ice Shelf, uh, which is really the home of all the early um, heroic age of Antarctic exploration. Mm -hmm. And that experience, I suppose, changed me and developed this passion for Antarctica, which I've continued with ever since I've been there. Yep. And what I'm trying to do, I suppose, is is uh, protect Antarctica because it's um, it basically protects us uh, in terms of keeping the temperatures on this planet uh, in a reasonable range. And with climate change, it Antarctica is starting to be affected. So I'm trying to put the word out there to people that we need to get our act together. And secondly, uh, I think that Antarctica is a metaphor, and, and I. I ask people often when I'm giving talks and whatever, what's your Antarctica? What's your passion that will make life worthwhile for you? And so, you know, Antarctica is, is a number of things to me. And so uh, recently I set up the Captain Antarctica tribe. I have a Facebook um, page as well, but I set up the Captain Antarctica tribe to, to put information out about Antarctica in short, easily readable um, bits mm -hmm. and at the same time asking for people to give me suggestions and encouragement because I have a plan to fly an electric aircraft from Scott base to the South Pole over the next few years yep. and the, the reason behind that is because renewables are the way to go even though a lot of people will poo poo them yep. uh, it's it's a never-ending flood now and there's no stopping it renewables are going to be the way to go and so I want to show people what's possible with renewable energy, especially in terms of electric aircraft, because they contribute to, a, a, because fossil fuel aircraft contribute a lot to the um, uh, climate change and uh, emissions into the atmosphere. Yep. Wow. That's, um, that's just a, fa a fascinating story. And, and I, I really appreciate that you've, you've brought to the, the audience attention that, what started this for you was to have experienced depression. And um, I understand that you've also got a, another club that you created. Um, is it the um, Mammoth Hunters Club? Is that yeah. something aligned with this same idea? Uh, pretty much. I, uh, I, I didn't realise uh, for some reason, I mean, even though I'd gone through depression myself, I didn't realise how common it was, especially amongst men, you know, and we're losing... Uh, every day we're losing eight people to suicide and six of those people are men. And so I thought, wow, you know, perhaps my experiences might help to give men an outlet, um, uh, you know, a club that they could join that can encourage them 
and help to bring them out of depression. And the amount of depression that's out there is, is quite amazing. I think it's the, uh, one of the reasons I called it the Mammoth Hunters Club is because, you know, we have the saying, the elephant in the room. Yeah. Well, to me, depression is really the mammoth in the room. It's, um, it's so prevalent and so uh, common uh, amongst men that it's, uh, it's a hidden, to some degree, uh, pandemic. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true, and it's the the statistics are quite, really quite frightening to think that, you know, the unspoken um, experience and the fact that there's so much uh, shaming about it. You know, it's it's something that a lot of men are too embarrassed to talk about. They're, they're ashamed of their feelings. We we don't encourage enough open communication about real emotions. Um, we we're too busy poo pooing things that we deem aren't you know, masculine enough and unfortunately it's costing lives. So totally applaud you for doing that. And, um, you know, it's it's really important that we do share our experiences because um, the thing that I believe about that is if you've get, gone through something and you've experienced something and you can articulate it by sharing it, you're making it um, real to somebody else, but you're also normalising it so that it's, well, I've gone through it, and if you're going through it, hey, you know, let, let's just talk about it. Um, rather than making it like, well, you don't talk about that, you're a bloke. And it's like, really? That's sad. So it's great that there are, you know, men out there that are willing to just say, hey, you know, this is something we need to to support each other with, um, you know. And, and suicide is, it's, it's tragic in itself that someone sees the need that, you know, not the need, but sees that there is no other way and faces that as their only way to escape the pain. Um, yet it's not just them that suffer, it's the ramifications of who goes through the, the grief and the loss. So it's great that there are support people like yourself out there. And that kind of segues me into something else that you do. Um, I believe that you've been involved um, with another project called The Grey Man, and I'm, I believe you might have founded that. Um, I would really like for you to, to let the audience know what it is that project's about, because that in itself is also quite an amazing thing that you're doing. Sure. Well, <coughs> I've moved on, I suppose, from The Grey Man. I mean, I was the president of that organisation for seven years. Uh, and it, it's no longer operating. But in the time that it operated, we rescued 176 women and children from brothels in Southeast Asia and from traffickers. And we prevented the trafficking of another 600 uh, children. Wow. And the whole idea uh, of that really, again, came out of depression. You know, I was at a low point in my life um, I, I was separated from my partner. My daughter was about five years old and she was um, staying with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was having this hard time dealing with the situation. And uh, at a very low point, I started taking antidepressants. Mm -hmm. And I don't take any kind of drugs, you know, I'm just not into it at all. Yeah. And um, the what happened was that uh, I was leaning up against the wall uh, of her room, my daughter's room while she was sleeping. And she, this voice came into my head and said, there are children her age uh, being abused in Southeast Asia. And I remember thinking to myself, well, where'd that come from? What's that about? And uh, it kind of went from there. A, a few weeks later, the army put money into my bank account, which I'd been waiting on for a couple of years. And a week later I was in, um, Thailand, uh, pursuing pedophiles and uh, traffickers. Wow. And that, from that initial experience, I rescued five girls and came back to Australia and, and gave a talk at a Rotary Club. And a couple of people in the Rotary Club came up to me and said, uh, how about um, we get involved with you and do something more? And I said, great. And so we went from there. We set up the Grey Man organization and, uh, you know, the rest is, uh, is history, really. Yeah, wow, that is that is like really phenomenal. And again, it's inspired by something that seemingly was so simple, as in you had a thought, you had an idea, and something obviously was quite emotional about that because you know you were looking at your own little girl, and and 
recognizing the vulnerability there and and just again that's why i find these conversations that i get to have with people so fascinating because it it's it takes even the smallest um kernel of thought to become an action that changes either the the you know the lives of a few or the lives of many across the globe and again applaud really for what you were doing because you know the number the, the ripple effect on that must be phenomenal for the, the the lives you've changed and you know yourself and those that got involved with you and that's that's the the beauty of a passion isn't it is where you can do something and it inspires others to want to participate and that's what i really value about experiences like you're sharing there oh absolutely and, you know people will um uh people will be inspired by that and have been inspired by that and led them to go and do something similar. Mm -hmm. And also, um, you know, it's, it's what, what I found from doing these various things over life is that, um, I, and I suppose it applies to women as well, but mainly to men, I think, is that the times when I have been happiest is when I've had um, a tribe, a purpose and an adventure. Mm -hmm. And the gray man gave me all of those things. Um, I, I developed a tribe of, because my background is in special forces. I developed a tribe of people who were either ex special forces or ex police or, or civilians mm -hmm. who were willing to volunteer their time to go to Thailand and rescue these kids. Wow. And the, um, the purpose was, was obvious, you know, we were doing some good in the world um, to help these kids. And at the same time, it was an adventure. Yeah. And, yeah these these kids i mean it's not it's it's one thing to rescue these kids but you need more than that so we put um 120 kids through school mm. and wow. the, the biggest thing you can do for um these kids is give them an education yeah. Yeah. and so you know some of them have gone on to university since then and you know we, we don't have any control over their lives some of them might slip back into that world but you know you can only do what you can do yeah and the um I think the the outcome of it all was um, was very positive. Yeah, 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 for sure. And as you say, you don't get to control in any way, shape, or form where those those young girls might take their lives. And you know, the idea really is to implement more than just the rescue, is to provide them with some sort of support that helps in some way to give them some hope. And I think that's that's one thing that I think is really critical to us in just being humans is a sense of hope and when hope starts to feel a little bit thin on the ground you know the world starts to seem a little less um, appealing to be in and I guess that applies across you know the concept of suicide you know you've got to give people a sense of hope you know girls that have got no choice because of the environment they're in but to consider a life of being involved in the, the, the sex uh, trafficking or sex world in some you know and, and often in a demoralizing way um, you know, you give them a sense of hope. That education would have been just a godsend to them. So, you know, it's it's it really is important. I think that's what I value about these Voice on Fire interviews, again, with talking to the people that I talk to, um, is that sense of that um, aspiring to have a community. And in your case, you mentioned a tribe, but I guess it plays across that concept of community. The more we are together and the more we join forces and the more we um, contribute together, the more we can achieve. So, you know, it's it's been amazing. The seven years of that must have been, you know, a fantastic experience for so many people. So again, what a great thing to do, um, which leads me into just asking a little bit more about something else you mentioned, um, your, your world in um, the, the military. So you're involved in the special forces. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting one, actually, because uh, I was talking to some people just um, just in the last week or so about, you know, the, the reason why we do certain things. And, you know, I went into Special Forces when I was uh, 18 years old. Um, I got kicked out after about three months because I was such a hippie. And, uh, and that kind of weighed heavily on me. And so I went back when I was uh, 32. Oh, wow. And um, I can tell you um, Special Forces is hard enough at 18, but at 32, it's way harder. Anyway, I got through Special Forces. I got my Green Beret. Yep. And, uh, you know, I love Special Forces. I probably would have um, stayed in that as my calling in life. 
especially if you know you have a government that is willing to use special forces in a good way mm. um, but uh, at the time uh, we were uh, we were well we weren't supporting I suppose but we were not doing anything to help the East Timorese people mm -hmm. and uh, you know I, I feel that we were partly responsible for that whole genocide that happened there and the the government at the time decided to send special forces people the SAS especially um, I was in commandos which is a different special forces group but they started to send the SAS to train the Indonesian uh, special forces mm -hmm. and basically they, they were just thugs in uniform and all it did was make them better at killing people mm -hmm. and uh, I objected to this and I remember going to my uh, my boss uh, I was I was a military intelligence guy in commandos which was quite unusual because I was Green Beret qualified but also an intelligence guy okay. and uh, I said to him you know this just uh, this is just wrong and he said to me yeah i agree he said but it's the way of the world and i said not my world and so i ended up uh, quitting uh special forces which was kind of disappointing at the time when you when yeah. you consider it's going to be your life's work yeah. uh but in the process i met some great people a lot of my friends still you know we're, we're talking 25 years after mm -hmm. they're um still good friends of mine from special forces and but but the thing that I realized, you know, because, because I was such a hippie and looking at, um, uh, you know, the, the introspection of why we do things, it finally dawned on me that special forces was really my way of trying to convince my father that I was special. Wow. Okay. That's and, uh, you know, my father was, um, he wasn't a bad man, but he wasn't, wasn't a good guy either. And he, he, really psychologically abused me mm. and uh, it took a long time for me to get over that yeah. and in the in the process I didn't realize it at the time but all I was trying to do was say hey dad look at me yeah. I'm okay you know yeah. and I'm actually special in special forces uh, but you know he came from a different generation and his father had never treated him terribly well so he didn't know how to deal with children and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I've forgiven him for, for the past, but I remember I, uh, I rang him once and I was telling him about what I was doing, you know, and uh, he said, uh, and I was saying, oh, you know, and, and look, I've done this and I've done that and da, da, da. And all I wanted was to, for him to say, well done. Mm. And, you know, he couldn't do it. Yeah. There was just silence on the end of the phone for about uh, probably probably 10 seconds and then he goes so how's your brother cherry doing right and so that that's his that's his that was his way upbringing that's his his thing so um it was interesting to kind of realize that after the fact yeah. that we are we are driven by things beneath the surface that we're not even consciously aware of you know but having said that I love special forces. I thought it was, you know, it was a boy's own adventure. Yeah. And again, I had tribe, purpose and adventure. Absolutely. And I, I really think for men, they're the three key ingredients to um, a happier life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I totally echo everything that you were talking about there from a point of view of um, a lot of the stuff that we perhaps are um, dealing with below the surface is often stuff that is just right down beyond the the i wouldn't say it's in the unconscious level because sometimes it is it's so buried and we don't know it's there but it's generally right down in that subconscious level where you can't help but know that something wasn't right in the way that the upbringing took place like you know it could be everyone's got a different upbringing and you know some aspects of it are not rosy and you know when you look back at that oftentimes it's not until we get to an older age that we're able to have that self-awareness and that that dawning of like, oh, wow, you know, now I kind of understand that. Um, I often reflect back at um, where I'm at and like I'm, I'm the age that I remember thinking about my own mother when she was this age and 
I have a particular, I was actually at her uh, 50th birthday party. So, I, um, you know, she was living in country Victoria and I was, um, I believe I was um, up in Sydney at the time or at least somewhere around that time. And I remember coming home for the party and thinking, because her birthday is just before Christmas, so I was home anyway, but coming home for the party. And I have this distinct memory of my mother and looking at her and just thinking, wow, you know, she's really changed. And then I remember, obviously, fast forward, I'm at that age, I'm at the same age, and I had my 50th, I was reflecting back going, wow, I'm the same age as my mum. And it wasn't just that realisation, it was me being able to see myself and recognise that mums of a different generation. And it's that whole, when people recognise that their parents really are a different generation and the way they were brought up and the things that happened in their world influenced the way that they behave. And, you know, the ripple effect is, is unless you actually have time for that deep introspective, uh, introspection, you know, sometimes you won't break a habit or, or break a way of behaving until you get a chance to understand how it all is intertwined and, and, and pulled apart. And, you know, in terms of um, the, the three qualities that you find made a difference for you, that, the, you know, the tribe and the adventure and the purpose, that's really, it's really valuable to know that those three things can help someone to make a difference within themselves because giving them that pointer, you, you, you've really given someone the foundations of how to, almost how to change their world. Find a, find a tribe, find the people that you belong with um, or create them. Be in that space around people that echo who you are. Um, find something that you're passionate about, as you said, something that you really you get excited about or you feel deeply about and, you know, go off and do it. Be a part of the experience of doing it because it will be one heck of an adventure. So I totally support what you're saying there. It's a really valuable insight. Um, and I know that just in regards to your special forces, I totally understand that it's, it's a really big part of your life. But I also, there's something else that came about with um, your story was um, your survival skills. Now, that, how that transitioned into um, reality television. Do tell us about that. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I, I was interested in survival since I was a young kid, you know, uh, I, partly to get away from my family. I used to head off into the hills when I was 15 by myself mm -hmm. and just camp out for a few days. And I wanted to be able to travel more lightly. So I started learning about wild foods and living off the land. Mm -hmm. And I'll take these, back then there wasn't much available and I would take these books um, out, uh, you know, the, the very few wild food books were around and, and I would try different things and sometimes they work, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd basically carry a blanket and a knife and that was pretty much about it. Yep. And from there, I, you know, it was kind of staring me in my, in my face. I used to sit up on this rock overhang uh, above Wollongong where I was brought up and uh, I used to think oh, what am I going to do with my life you know what's my future going to be and it was kind of staring me in the face that I really love doing this survival stuff okay. so uh, when I was about 24 I started actually teaching it and um, you know I've taught survival um, over the years well for about 30 years I suppose now uh, or more actually I took a break from it for a while uh, and there's there's something about you know getting in touch with nature which has a positive effect on the human brain and if you can uh, embody some of these skills it makes that enjoyment even greater so I was I suppose I was getting a name for myself to some degree I was on television a few times and various things and the people who were doing the original Australian Survivor contacted me wow. and asked me if I'd be the survival consultant and the games and challenges designer for um, for Australian Survivor. And so they ring me up and really more so than survival, what they wanted was someone who could build basically an obstacle course. Yep. And I guess their thinking was, oh, you know, special forces, you know, you can do anything. You can fly helicopters, you could... <laughs> You could pilot yeah. a spaceship. You could, yeah. you, you can build an obstacle course, right? Now I'd, I'd run plenty of obstacle courses in the military, but I didn't have the first idea about how to build an obstacle course. So yeah. they, they're saying, so we really need someone to build an obstacle course for us. 
And I went, sure, I can do that. No <laughs> idea. No idea whatsoever. And uh, luckily, the set designer was a very knowledgeable guy. And I came up with the plans and he basically helped me build it. But we built all the, the challenges for the, for the show. But the survival side of it, uh, they, they told me that I'd be doing um, two days of survival training <clears throat> with these people. And I thought, great, okay. Anyway, it kept getting put back and put back and put back and put back. And we're, we're down at the place where they were running it uh, and uh, the show's kind of already started. And then I'm thinking, well, it doesn't look like they're doing anything with the survival stuff, which is kind of strange. Uh, and then one day they, they came and got me. I was in the main tent and they came and got me and they said, um, are, you, are you okay to teach the survival stuff now? I said, yeah, sure. And they said, uh, I said, well, how, how long have I got? And they said, oh, about 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so we've gone from two days to 15 minutes of survival training. And I went, right, okay. So I had to think about it. I thought, okay, these people have got shelter. They've got like a tarpaulin and they've got up. Uh, they've got access to water uh, because they, there was a bore on this property that they could access. Mm -hmm. uh, salty, water was kind of salty, but it was bearable. And um, so they had shelter, they had water. Uh, I think they had access to fire. So the only other thing that was going to be really important to them was food. And Food is actually, for short-term survival, it's actually your lowest priority. The other things are much more important, right? But these guys were going to be out there for, you know, whatever time it was, six weeks or something like that. So I decided to teach them um, some wild foods and I uh, taught, them, taught them how to catch fish using double, double hooks on their lines. And the place was so abundant that you could throw a line in off the rocks of the coast, leave it for 20 seconds, and you'd pull it up and you'd have a fish on each hook. So wow. I, taught them, I taught them that. And then I taught them about some of the shell, shellfish they could eat. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then my 15 minutes were up, right? And so I went back to working on the designing stuff and, and all that. And, uh, but a bit later on, a few weeks in, the, the, uh, a few of the people were, were complaining of constipation. Oh, okay, right, yeah. because their diet was was fairly limited. You know, I think they had rice and they had the fish that they were catching, whatever. And so I, I said to um, the one of the producers, "Oh, look, I can I can show them some wild foods that will probably help with that." And he said, "Oh no," he said, "We love constipation." And I said, <laughs> "Oh, why is that?" And and he showed me this video of you know one of the guys going off to the toilet and they're just filming this blank space in the distance where he's gone behind some trees or whatever. And all you could hear was this, Oh, ah, because of the constipation. And I said, well, that, that makes great television, but I don't know that it makes good health. So when the, when the producers weren't watching, I pulled the survivors apart and I said, look, see this, this, um, this fruit here, this, this, this um, wild food. I said, it's bountiful. It's coming into season now. You should eat as much of this as you can. And oh, so wow. off they went and did that without the producers knowing. So it seemed to help. <laughs> but it was experience. a good experience. You know, I, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed working on Survivor. It was a good experience. But funnily enough, after that, I'd had enough of Survival. You know, I taught Survival all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I realized reality TV just wasn't my scene. Uh, they, they actually contacted me for, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And, and I said, I went up to see them and I just thought, nah, I don't want to be a part of this stuff anymore. Um, and I actually gave survival away for a period of time, okay. um, as a kind of reaction to it. Cause I just thought oh, it's too much. I'm, I'm a bit of a, bit of a purist with, yeah. with survival, you know, that it's, it's really a skill that everyone should know mm. but reality tv turns it into something different you know and bear grills has turned it into something different exactly. and so um I, I left it for a long period of time but now i'm i'm back into it and i'm feeling happier about it you know because mm. it's my my head space has changed as well yeah yeah and i mean as you say survival skills um again you, you, something that i know you would relate to anyway because you're learning to fly 
um, and with you know, regrettably having to reference a, a negative situation, but unfortunately planes do come down. And there are many stories about planes that uh, for whatever reason, there's been a mechanical fault, something's gone wrong, and the plane has had to, um, you know, ditch somewhere. And, you know, quite often the people that are on board, those that don't get injured or those that are injured, but, you know, when there's not a uh, fatality, those people need to survive. And often they're in places. I remember one story was about a, a plane that landed somewhere in one of the, um, I don't know exactly where in Africa it landed, but it was in a very hostile environment. And it was just by chance that a couple of the people on board were at least semi-familiar with the idea that, you know, there are things we need to do in order to survive. So the idea mm -hmm. is you just never know when you may need to be called upon to actually put some of that action into place. But not only that, it's as, as you've just referenced, the whole mindset thing is a really important part of it. And it's even if you never use the skills, knowing that you've got that level of competency builds your confidence. And I think it's really important that we recognise that, unfortunately, we've kind of created this world where, you know, the, the kids of the world are not getting exposed to anything that tests their abilities. So they're not really facing any, uh, I guess you could say, controlled adversity. They're not learning how to um, survive in a situation. And, you know, that that has pretty horrible ramifications in itself. So... I think it's fantastic, the idea of survival. I mean, I was brought up in the country. Um, I was originally born in um, the suburbs of Melbourne, but lived in the country for a long time. And this is one of the best experiences for me because I learned how to light fires. I learned how to just, you know, become a little bit more self-sufficient. I can plant things. I can grow things. I can do stuff that I know many of my peers and counterparts in the suburbs have no idea about. And I really feel for them because... I think the more you get exposed to experiences that test who you are, obviously it leads to a better self-awareness and a better development of your character and, and your competency and confidence. I, I wonder if you agree with that. Oh, absolutely. I think that the, the, the real thing about survival is about the confidence. It's about uh, changing your attitude about yourself because the, the most common belief that I think people have. Many years ago, I, I trained as a rebirther and the oh, yeah. issues that came up, most of the time, the, the most common belief that humans have is that they are not good enough. Yeah. And anything that can change that around and make them believe that they can opens up a whole new world of pos uh, possibilities to them. Yeah. And so even though I teach survival, what I'm really teaching is attitude change yeah absolutely and and you know you, the 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 five elements of survival are shelter water fire and food and but the top one is attitude mm. because you might screw it up with all those others but if you've got the right attitude to keep going um then that has a lot to do with overcoming a lot of the difficulties in life and uh, you're speaking about kids uh i i did teach kids long 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 time ago uh, and I let it drop, but just recently, earlier this year, I taught, um, I started doing these one day survival trainings for kids. And uh, that was a great, great experience. And these kids were wonderful. They were just uh, such sponges for absorbing information. Um, a bit maddening when you try and teaching them fire to stop them from setting fire to themselves and everyone around them. But uh, the enthusiasm, yeah. was just great and you know and I, and I have it in my head i think oh kids today they're all stuck with their iphones and whatever but um these kids were just really um open mm. to the experience yeah and so um i plan to do more of those uh one day courses for kids because i think uh one of the things that i've been stressing lately you know covid19 mm. has shown people how dependent we are on our system and when the system fails what do you do and as I've said to people, you know, uh, look at what happened with people stocking toilet paper, Absolutely. you know, like yep. crazy behavior. Yep. But if you think about it, well, what, what, what are your alternatives? Well, there are alternatives to toilet paper, you know, in the bush, there are plenty of alternatives. Yep. Uh, what's, what do you do about food? There's plenty of wild food around. Mm. You just have to know what you're doing with it, you know, because yep. some of it's poisonous, some of it has to be treated. Yep. Um, and so I started doing a few short 
clips uh, about survival. And when I was doing Facebook Lives, uh, I started during COVID-19, which is, I guess, still going, mm -hmm. I started showing people different wild foods that they could supplement their diet with yep. just to get them started on an idea of being self-sufficient from the system yep. because we don't know what's going to happen next, really. And I mean, another COVID-19 could come along, it could be worse. Yep. So I think, I think survival skills or wilderness skills, whatever you want to call it, is an important adjunct to people's knowledge. And if you don't have that, you can know everything you want to know about, you know, Facebook and um, the internet and whatever, but it won't do you much good if you're stuck trying to find food in the bush. Yeah. So yeah. I think these skills are really important. Whether people learn from me or learn from other people, I encourage people to go and do it. Yeah, yeah, oh, totally. The whole COVID thing has just really shown the base behaviour of a lot of people. Um, it's tragic to think that some people just went into absolute panic mode immediately. And obviously there's, it doesn't help when television promotes things like um, the, um, the, the oh, I can't think what they're called, the Doomsday Preppers, I think is one of the shows. I mean, I don't watch any of this stuff, but you become aware that it's on. And, you know, Doomsday Preppers, I mean, I've no idea what the, the uh, I can imagine what the show is about, having never seen it, but just the concept of that, seems to suggest, you know, you've got to prepare for everything, so stockpile everything. And the idea of that means that it's all well and good you stockpiling, but what about the poor little old lady down the road who can't get to the shop? And when she gets there, when she finally finds a way to get there because she's pretty frail and can't get there very often, she gets there and there's no loo paper. What's she supposed to do? And there's so much unfortunate development of this. Um, we're, we're so closed off. We're Again, that lack of community. We're so closed off and we're so driven to our own self-survival um, in our own little bubble that we've forgotten that the more community-based we are and the more we reach out and support each other, there's less need for all of this panic-driven behaviour. And, you know, we just be a little bit more rational, sit back and realise, well, there's no point panicking. What was the point of the panic in the first place? The toilet paper's <laughs> still there, you know, the shops are still open, you know, there's, there was no real capacity to evaluate what the real situation was. It was just like, the media said that so we're just going to panic and we don't care about what happens to anybody else. We're, we're okay in our little bubble. And I, I find that really, it's, it's insightful. I've found the whole COVID thing for me has been a fascinating insight into human behaviour. And um, it, it, one of the other things that came about from what you were just saying is recognising that there are you know, different foods that you can eat. And I, I laughingly think about that because in the backyard of the house that I'm in, I, uh, at one point, was trying to sort of set up the, the garden in a better way and I was mowing it down and I found a lot of things were buried in the garden. I won't go into that. That's a story for another time. But as I was digging it up, um, I found that by disturbing the soil, what ended up happening was that all these weeds started growing. And mm -hmm. they, when I did a little bit of research into it, they're not really weeds. They're not... Well, they're weeds by our labelling... But we're talking stinging nettle, we're talking purslane, we're talking marshmallow, and we're talking dandelion. And the, I, the, I, absolutely, and the irony is I actually love dandelion grounds as a coffee substitute. Mm. And I'm looking at stinging nettle, and I was, I, the entire backyard was just stinging nettle central there for a bit. And I was a little bit, because I react very badly when I'm stung, so I was a little bit sensitive about it. But a little bit of Google research, and all you have to do basically is pick the stuff, dry it out, chop it up, and it becomes just the equivalent of spinach, and it's yeah. infinitely yeah. better for you. And it was like and nettle, nettle soup as well. absolutely nettle soup. Lots of recipes online for nettle soup. So really does come down, as you say, change in attitude, change in perception, change in the knowledge factor. That once we're aware of different things, in a way that breaks us out of the um, habit of living in our little survival bubble. It just, it's almost an adventure in itself, isn't it? It becomes really quite fascinating. And we can almost translate those three points you talk about, the community, the purpose, and, and or, or tribe purpose and adventure into learning how to um, uh, look at the survival environment around us and the food and things that we can eat. That's an adventure in itself going out. I believe in, there may be in Victoria, I'm not sure 100%, but there are... Um, 
wild food gatherers, people that go out and actually educate people about which wild foods you can pick from within the, um, you know, the natural environment. And I think we just need more of that. We need to be able to encourage more community gardens and things that allow us to be less, as you say, dependent upon the system because you just never know. In Melbourne, and, and I know that you're in Brisbane and your, your um, environment up there is perhaps a little less intense than what it is down here with the COVID, we've, we've just gone into our second wave. And when they were saying, you know, the second wave's going to come, I actually live in one of the hotspot um, uh, regions. So it's just, I've just been constantly hearing this just out outbreak here, this outbreak, we've just had 20 new outbreaks. And it's like, oh my goodness. And, you know, in reality, it is just a virus. There's many of them out there. There's hundreds and thousands of them. The only real tragedy with this is the fact that it is an airways virus and it makes for frightening loss of breath in people that are vulnerable to it. And it's, it's vulnerable to, you know, the, the more the, the elderly are vulnerable and the younger people and people with illnesses. So it's, it's something that we're exposed to. We, we've got them in our community anyway. And I laughingly said to somebody, well, do you know that the bubonic plague still exists? We didn't wipe it out. The bubonic plague, the actual virus that causes that, is still active around the world. We just happen to have learned how to control it. So we're going to, as you say, the potential for some other disaster type thing to come along, very real. And we just need to look at, well, how are we responding? What could we do differently? So, I, you know, I think what you're talking about there makes a whole lot of sense in, in you know, no uncertain terms. Um, and, yeah. Well, when you when you consider that you know COVID nineteen pretty much uh, <clears throat> temporarily destroyed the world economy, uh, you know, and it's it's a virus that um, that doesn't doesn't kill billions of people, you know, it's killed a number of people, which is very sad. But uh, even a virus like this uh, has decimated uh, economies all over the world, and so I think people have to start looking to themselves and community as a as a way of protection if you think about um aboriginal people in their traditional times you know it was it was the tribe that kept them going uh as a group because you know the women would process a lot of the toxic foods which gave the uh the tribe the staples that they needed and the men would be hunting which would collect the protein and all that kind of stuff and so they were all working together. If you were an individual kicked out of the tribe, mm -hmm. you would have a much harder time of it. Um, and look, I understand where the preppers come from. They see themselves as being just being practical, mm. you know. And uh, but I think there's a, I think there's an underlying belief amongst them. I don't see myself as a prepper, mm. but I think there's an underlying belief uh, from them that if the world goes down the tube, they will survive and it will be a great challenge and adventure. And, and I suspect they haven't got enough challenge and adventure in their life at the moment. But at the same time, I think the preppers have formed their own community. Mm. So they have their tribe, they have their purpose, yeah. and this is their adventure. So I'm not knocking them. You know, I think, um, I think, they, you know, I think they are being practical in, in mm. one way, yeah. but it's, it's us versus them. You know, yeah. it's uh, where we're not part of the global community, but you can bet there'll be people knocking on their door mm. if, if the, you know, proverbial hits the fan uh, and then they're going to have to make some choices. So yeah, I'd rather not be in that situation. Yeah. I, I'd rather rely yeah. on my, my knowledge of the bush yeah. to, to survive. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, again, you know, the, the, the doomsday preppers, the, in one sense, maybe they are a little bit on the smart side by stockpiling. It's just unfortunate that in the current situation that, um, that you know, in the very whisper of a, a second wave in Victoria, um, a lot of people just went out and stripped the supermarket shelves again. And, and sadly, the supermarkets just didn't get in on the, um, the wisdom quick enough. They've now implemented again the restriction, restrictions on purchases, which is just as well. But again, it comes down to that sense of community, are we actually acting in a sense of community? Are we really thinking about other people around us? And the, the, the value that I, I really aspire to, um, to deliver with regards to Voice on Fire, it's to remind us that we are part of a community 
And even though each person I speak to represents a different group or a different organisation or a different founding um, 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 pro a program or project that they're working on, we are all collectively part of something that matters. And, you know, if we all work together, we have infinitely more success if we, um, you know, all are driven by a similar um, outcome, then we're more likely to achieve that outcome. And I just think it's really important that we do, you know, echoing what you're saying, we do need to find that community or that tribe and work together on that joint purpose because, you know, that's really what will help us to survive going forward. So I think um, you make a lot of valid points there. Well, if you think about it, you know, uh, the modern the modern era where we are in nuclear families is uh, something of a rarity because we have we have lived in tribes for most of our history. You know, if you looked at a clock and it was human history, it'd be like the last couple of minutes that we have lived like we are now. And it's not particularly natural to us. I mean, our natural proclivity is to be a part of a tribe. And it's what kept us going for, for all these millennia. And, uh, you know, if you think of it going back to the issue of, of men in depression, and if you think of it from a tribal point of view, if you wanted space to yourself in, in throughout history, uh, when we were tribes, then you had to leave the tribe mm. and go away. But we have the reverse of that. Now you are, not you particularly, but you know, people in general are um, basically alone or in, in a very limited tribe, it's like a family. And if they want contact with other humans, they have to go out mm. and make that contact. Yeah. Whereas in the past, the contact was always around you. Yeah. So it's, it's a reverse of how we've been for millions of years. Mm. Um, and I think that that has led to uh, it's partly led to the depression that a lot of people feel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's been such a breakdown in our sense of community. It's, it's really important. I think that's the one thing that I've been focusing on for quite some time and the opportunity within um, COVID, obviously, but also just I've always been driven to um, engage with other people and learn their stories. And, you know, it's just different things like my background was in psychiatric nursing. So, you know, um, seeing... The good, the bad, and the ugly in that is is an interesting insight into human behaviour. And mm -hmm. um, the just this this whole voice on fire thing gives me an understanding of the different ways that people want to connect. And I think it's just really important that we re-establish a sense of community. It's just become that thing that that's my focus is how do we re-establish the sense of community? We've got to reach out. We've got to have the conversations. And sometimes you've got to ask the awkward questions, which I'm finding that I'm doing in some of my interviews is just feeling I get a little bit awkward because I know the sensitivity behind it, but I'm also pretty bold and we'll just say, well, look, we need to ask these questions because if we don't, we're, we're kind of putting something under that um, taboo sort of blanket and we just makes it, again, leads to such things as depression. If we don't openly talk about those awkward things, then it's almost like we're not allowed to talk about them. And it's like, no, I'm... I'm Voice on Fire is all about the flaming microphone. Turn up the heat. We've got to do this. We've got to speak up. And, you know, I get to have these amazing conversations with people like yourself that um, are just driven to make a difference on the planet. Um, so just to sort of wrap up, I guess, what we, what we could look at there is just um, it's going to be really interesting to how, you, how you might want to put this in a nutshell. It'll be interesting to see, you know, what focus you want people to, to, um, to have in regards to the projects and things you're working on, um, what is it you do, who you do it for, and why you do it, if you want to wrap up with that. Hmm. Well, it's interesting that you put up the issue of hope before because at one stage there, people were trying to, to describe me and, you know, they were talking about being a coach and being a mentor and I didn't, didn't really relate to any of that at all. I don't see myself as a coach or a mentor. Uh, but I thought about it one day and I thought, you know, what I am is, and I don't mean to sound arrogant about this, but what I am is an inspirer. Mm. And what, what I give people is hope, mm. which is what you were talking about before. Yeah. And I think hope is often in short supply on this planet. And 
by giving people hope. And when I say people, I mean the people that follow me or look at my stuff or, you know, may be inspired by something I do. Um, and I think that that is uh, a valuable commodity. Mm. Absolutely. Hope is hope is what keeps people going, and especially people who are say depressed. That's definitely uh, something to keep them going. And so, I suppose my my main focus now is you know uh, the Antarctic stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, I guess I'd encourage people to maybe join my Captain Antarctica tribe, yep. mainly because it's not just about Antarctica. It's it's about what is your Antarctica? Yeah, exactly. If I can inspire you with, with what's been important to me, you may find something in it that's important to you. And what I'm, what I'm trying to incorporate now is not just the Antarctic stuff, but also my journey to, to learn to fly, to um, fly this plane to the South Pole. But also I'm about to start putting in short videos about survival as well. So you have this combination of things which I think may be useful mm. to to people and regardless of whether any of those things particularly interest you it's the it's the motivation to find your tribe mm. find your purpose and find adventure yeah. that I think can inspire other people to find their own tribe purpose and adventure yeah. so I, I would encourage people to just if they're interested to just just type in to Facebook search Captain Antarctica tribe and I'll come up. Yeah. And uh, you know, I only instigated this. I've been running the Captain Antarctica Facebook page for a few years now and I've got a few thousand followers on that, but I didn't feel that it was tribal enough. You yeah. know, it wasn't a community. Yeah. So that's why I've switched over to the Captain Antarctica tribe. I only started it a few weeks ago and we've got about 300 and something people so far and that's just going to grow over the next few months um but i'd encourage them to go have a look yeah absolutely absolutely yeah and i think you've you've um actually summed that up really really well and i think it is important that we remember that hope is that one thing that does keep us alive and it's that thing that enables us to take the next step and do the next thing and believe in ourselves and, you know, I'm often reminded, um, I have a, a particular amateur interest um, as a historian, very amateur, but in um, World War One, World War Two, I always wanted to understand, well, how did it all start? Um, and the fascination, like it's a, it's a gruesome story. It's horrific. It's beyond all imagination. And the video footage is just so disturbing. Um, but I, I reflect back on those people that were in the uh, concentration camps and some of the, the footage is horrific, beyond words. Um, but some of them had hope. They just, they maintained that sense of connection with each other and they had hope. They believed that they in some way would survive. And it's that mindset of survival. And if anybody wants to really get an understanding of you know, human depravity and, and human survival, just start tuning into some of the documentaries. It's, it's horrendous what humans can do to each other, but it's beautiful to watch survival and what it can mean and how people can take something from that. And again, it comes down to, you know, there's, there's hope, a sense of hope. And I think you, you speak of that and you really create that, that, um, that, sense of hope for people in what you're doing. So I think that's it's really awesome. And I've really enjoyed this conversation, Sean. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. What I'd like to do, yeah, what I'd like to do is um, encourage people to be able to contact you and reach out to you. You've mentioned the um, Captain Antarctica Tribe uh, group on Facebook. So obviously if they type that in, it'll come up. Um, yep. Is there anything else that they can look out for in the way of... Um, contacting you on the internet. One of the things to that will be, um, I'll grab all of your details anyway, and in the description for this video and also for the podcast, it'll be loaded in the description so people, when they come into the video, can just scroll down to the description and find all your contact details. Just uh, share a few of them here. Uh, sure, well, sure. the other thing, that, especially for men, uh, because it's a men-only group, 
Uh, the Mammoth Hunters Club is another Facebook group on Facebook, which um, men can join. And uh, that's, that's been pretty popular. Uh, I think it's doing a lot of good for helping men uh, find an outlet. Um, and they can also uh, look at my Captain Antarctica website, which uh, is, is more for just interest in Antarctica. You know, lots of stories on there about various Antarctic things. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, they can also contact me on Facebook, Sean McBride, oh. uh, you know, in Brisbane. So Fantastic. any any of those options. Awesome. Excellent. Well, as I said, I'll include all those details. And uh, by all means, if anyone's actually watching this, so to, to those who are watching this, one thing I do want to say is if you are having any issues and you're finding that perhaps you have experienced depression and there's anything that's perhaps this discussion's brought up in you, by all means, please reach out and contact. I am more than available to, to take anyone's contact. My details will be in the, the description of this video as well. Um, if you need to be part of Sean's uh, uh, Mammoth Hunters Club, reach out and be, um, be part of that community. You'll need, community so important, I can't emphasize that enough. But if this has triggered anything, by all means, you are not alone. Do not face this alone. Reach out, find that person that will listen. And by all means, that is something that I do. I, I, my background is in psychiatric nursing, so I do have a professional understanding. I've also been on that journey myself personally, so I can relate. And I just openly encourage you, don't face anything alone. That's why these conversations are so important. Um, and Sean, I just want to say thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I look forward to tuning in and just finding out more about your adventures as you go forward. Thanks, Terry. I really enjoyed talking to you. Excellent. So I will upload this soon and uh, we'll share the link as the time uh, comes available in the next, uh, the next couple of hours. But uh, thank you again and uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. My pleasure.